Good morning, beloved. We continue our series from the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew chapters 5 to 7. And if you've been following us for this past few weeks and months, you'll know that we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount passage by passage, paragraph by paragraph, and we arrive at this particular paragraph right now that talks about worry. Uh, well, I'd like you to know that worry is a problem we all have and no one is exempt from it. I am worried that this sermon on worry will not stop you from worrying. So it didn't work for me. Well, I'm a work in progress like all the rest of you. Because all of us worry. All of us. No exemptions whatsoever. Reminds me of a man who went to his pastor and said, You know, pastor, I am worried. Uh, yeah, what's your problem? You know that my wife, pastor, loves to read classic books. Yes, and so, well, five years ago, pastor, my wife, read A Tale of Two Cities. So five years ago, we had twins. Three years ago, she read The Three Musketeers. After that, she had triplets. So the pastor said, so what's your problem? Pastor, right now, she is, worry, uh, she is reading the book The Birth of a Nation. So that man probably should be campaigning for the RH bill or at least reading it. But one of the things you learn from this passage, even as you were just reading it, I hope you realize it. Christ doesn't want us, friends, to be plagued by anxiety that arises because we cannot trust God. God wants you and me to have deep Peace, deep serenity, security that comes from the assurance that we can put our trust in God. That when we seek Him first, He'll take care of everything else in my life and in your life. That's what He wants to happen. And that's why Jesus spoke these words precisely so that you can overcome whatever is giving you anxiety today. All of us came this Sunday morning from different contexts. Some of you came here and you sort of brought the office with you. Maybe you own the business or you're the executive there and the things happening there are still with you. Or maybe you brought your family issues here or your problems as a professional, as a lawyer, as a doctor, you brought them here. Well, if it's any comfort, most of us did the same thing today. But I'm going to request you today, whatever it is that you brought here with you, that plagues you, that bothers you, let's look at it together in the light of the Scriptures. And why don't we ask the Lord to help us listen today. Let's pray. Father, none of us is exempt from this, Lord. Nobody, not myself or my family or my friends who are here today, all of us struggle with this. Thank you, Lord, that when Jesus spoke this word to the original audience thousands of years ago, they are as relevant today as they were then to his disciples. They worried. He called them you of little faith. Today, Lord, we struggle with the same. We are all fellow strugglers in this journey, Lord. Help us, Father. Help us as we listen to the words of Christ, as we imbibe them. Will you please transform us, Father, by renewing our minds, changing our perspectives, helping us see, Lord, that there are basic things that should have been there and over the years have been set aside. Help us come to you today with rejoicing if you help us walk with you, with repentance if we have somehow fallen short, but always with gladness because of the grace you've given us through Christ. Thank you that the Savior who spoke these words does not use them, Lord, to judge us, to make us feel bad, but to turn to Him, to ask Him to enable us to do what pleases you. Thank you, Lord, that this is not the way to legalism, but this is the way to perpetual Christian joy, to seek you first. Guide us, we pray, Father. Open our hearts and minds. Speak to the Holy Spirit. Lift up Christ so that you are glorified, Father. 
and hide your servant behind your cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you notice Christ is warning, warning against worry. There's a temptation there I'd like to warn against right from the beginning. When Jesus says, do not worry, it doesn't mean that, okay, I will go home after this service. I will now sit in my favorite chair in front of my TV, open to my favorite channel, and then not work anymore. Because I will just trust God that when I pray, He will send food while I'm sitting there not working. That's not what He's talking about. He's not talking about work. He's talking about worry. In fact, the rest of the scripture is very clear. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. That's very clear. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, Paul told the Thessalonians, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. So that tells you and me something. God provides food for the birds. Christ will use them as an example later. But notice, He doesn't drop the food into their mouths. The birds have to hunt and search for their food. The counterpart to you and me, we've got to work. So this is not about work, but this is about what we will define as a persistent anxiety from a failure to trust God. It has to be persistent. If it's momentary and we are forced to pray and we resort to prayer, we don't think that's wrong. But when it's unresolved, when it's persistent, then we call that worry and God calls that wrong. Now the word worry there in your Bibles, in the NIV, which most of us have, comes from a root word called mirimna. Mirimna in Greek. And this is interesting because when mirimna is used in Jewish religious literature, in the writings of the rabbis, it usually refers to insomnia. It's connected with insomnia, loss of sleep. So what does that tell you? The worry here is the kind of anxiety persists unresolved because I've failed to trust God. I've looked at God wrongly. I've sized Him up wrongly. I've forgotten or misjudge his attributes, and so I have worried. And Jesus would say so many words just to drive one point home. It's wrong to worry because there's absolutely no reason for it. And at the onset, I'd like you to know that God's remedy for worry is to simply put him first. Put him first and to trust him. Not depend on our own understanding. Put Him first and trust Him that when I put Him first, my friends, He will take care of everything else in my life. That requires trust. Because all I need to do is to seek Him first. Seek His face. Seek His righteousness which follows when I seek God. God says, I'll take care of your survival. I will never let you down. I will not break any of my promises to you. Right at the beginning, I know some of you are saying, Pastor, how does that relate to my situation? If only you know what I'm going through. To be honest, I don't. I don't know what you're going through. It's good. Because I could also tell you what I am going through. And somebody could come to you and say, well, this is what I am going through. Each of us carry our own burdens, friends. Yours might seem like Herculean for you to carry. But somebody could come up to you and say, well, this is what I'm carrying. And then you might say, well, it doesn't seem I have a problem. I don't have a problem compared to you. So I'm saying this because we are not insensitive. Some who came here today who are carrying burdens you find almost unbearable. And I'm asking you, as gently as I can, please consider the words of Christ. They do not trivialize your sorrow, your pain. If you are in such a situation, He's simply saying, I'd like you to put your trust in me. That if you put me first, you will never be last in my eyes. So he tells us why our worry is unfounded, then gives the remedy for it. 
Let's look at the first thing that Jesus tells us. This is God's requirement about worry. Verse 25. He's saying, do not worry because first, worry distorts our priorities. He said, don't worry about your life. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Now, Christ is not saying here, I, I do not recognize the reality of your needs. That's not what he's saying. He's actually saying, but there is much more to life than food and clothing. I'd like you to understand also that Christ here is not limited to just food and clothing because obviously you need something more than that. But these are, in a sense, metaphors for the rest of life's needs. You need food, you need drink, you need clothing. Today there are other needs. There's education, there's, there's health care, there's shelter. And all of these friends are represented by this category he's putting in front of us. He just wants us to consider that there's much more to life than survival. That's why he asked the question. Look at this question. He said, isn't, the, isn't life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? You know, it's worded in such a way in the Greek that you have to answer yes. It's a, it's a question that's rhetorical and the answer is always yes. In other words, yes, life is more important than food. What is he trying to drive home here? Well, it's a form of argumentation called from the greater to the lesser. It goes like this. It requires great power. To, pr to create human life. You and I were born as miracles of God. Scientists will exhaust all, all millions and billions of money to try to, to discover the secrets and miracles of life. But at the end of the day, God holds the secrets to that. And at the end of the day, that is His miracle, not human. So if God is capable of granting us life an act requiring great power, Surely he can sustain us by providing food and act requiring less power. Do you see that? From the greater to the lesser. If God can, can create the human body and act requiring great power, surely he can clothe the body and act requiring lesser power. That's what Jesus is saying here. And if I worry, if you worry, we suddenly think that Food and clothes, survival is more important than a lot of other things. But Jesus is saying, no, there's much more to that and God can provide that because he already gave you greater things than you realize. Secondly, another reason why we should not worry is because God cares about you more than all of creation, he said. Look at the birds of the air. You know, I'd like to imagine that Jesus was there standing on that hillside Maybe a flock of birds passed by and he said, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor store into barns. And then the audience, the audience at that time was perhaps wondering, what's your point? Then he said, yet they do not go hungry. What's the reason? Your heavenly Father feeds them. That's interesting. You have your Bibles in Luke 12, 24. That's a parallel passage to the Sermon on the Mount. You find out that the birds are ravens. That's interesting. You know why it's interesting? Uh, you see, ravens are unclean animals. Uh, in case you've not seen a raven, have you ever seen a crow? Well, they're related to each other. They look a bit alike. They don't look too good. They're black, and, and they look sinister, and they don't look very appealing. When God told Noah, Noah, you bring into the ark both clean and unclean animals, the clean animals had to go by seven. Remember that? The unclean animals by two. Why will God use a raven, an unclean animal? This time it's from the lesser to the greater. If God will take care of unclean animals called ravens that you Jews do not even regard, how much more will he take care? of man, made in the image of God, the pinnacle of God's creation. That's one point there. But there's another, even more important point. That is contained in the phrase, your heavenly Father. 
You know, it's significant. We're not nitpicking here or splitting hairs. The word your is significant because it's totally different if Jesus said, yet their heavenly father. No, he said, your heavenly father. What does that mean? He's saying, look, he's your heavenly father. The birds cannot call him their heavenly father. And yet, your heavenly father takes care of them. How much more you? You belong to him. That, friends, is the point that Jesus was driving at. You have not just a unique role in creation because you're man. You have something that even other men don't have. Most men on the street don't have. If you have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that applies to you, your heavenly Father. And Jesus said, are you not much more valuable than they? Who is the you? It's the Christian. It's the disciples he was addressing. And that's wonderful. I'd like to highlight that and dwell on it. Because not everybody, friends, can call God your, can call God my heavenly Father. I know some of us were taught in elementary and high school, perhaps if you went to a certain school, even in college, to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. But Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who calls God Father will be recognized by God as his son or daughter. I'm saying this because if you're here today, and you've never made a decision to recognize that we have sinned against God and that you've never turned to Christ as Savior and Lord, what I'm going to say this morning is just a set of moral instructions that are guaranteed to discourage you. They don't apply. And I'm sorry for saying that, but they don't apply to people who have no personal relationship with Christ. I say this not with unkindness. I say this because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father except through me. Not being born and raised in a certain religion, not that can give you that relationship. You have to come to Christ and tell him, I acknowledge that I have sinned against a holy God. I am not worthy of a holy God. So I turn to Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross in my place, and I receive that sacrifice. I receive that Savior. When you do that, then, and only then, can you say, my Heavenly Father, then and only then, does it apply to you, your Heavenly Father. You're much more valuable to your Heavenly Father than even the raven's friends. And I hope you do not leave this place without telling Jesus Christ words like these from your heart. They can be as simple as you want it, but it's a simple abandoned faith in Christ, trusting in nothing and no one else. And that will bring you into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The second illustration that he would use is the wild flowers that were commonly growing on the hillsides of Palestine. He, he, he said, well... Look at those lilies of the field. I know that's how the NIV translated it. They could be translated other ways, but the point is, we believe, many people believe, they refer to the anemones that were growing in the hillsides of Palestine. They were usually colored bright or deep purple. And Jesus said, you see those wild flowers? They're colored like the robes of the kings, but not even Solomon, who is Solomon, the king of Israel. It is widely believed by the Jews that nobody topped Solomon when it came to luxury and, and splendor. But Jesus said, not even Solomon could hold a candle to the beauty of this flower. That's not the main point. It's still coming. What's the main point of Jesus Christ? He said, but it's here today. Tomorrow it's cast into the fire. What is he referring to? These flowers were not famous just for being beautiful. They were famous for being very transient. You see, the Jewish women, like, like our, our friends in the provinces, when they were about to start a fire, they looked for extremely flammable things called tinder. 
These beautiful flowers that you see today and you admire, they look better than King Solomon. Tomorrow they could be so dried up, they serve as tinder. And Jesus said, they're so beautiful, but so transient. But God takes care of them. How about you? And we believe he's referring here not just to a fire here on earth. We believe he's referring to what God saves us from, from the eternal fire and separation of hell. He's actually telling Christians here, believers, the disciples, if God could save you from the eternal fires of hell, can he not also save you? From the temporary things here like the elements by giving you clothing. Because God takes care of the flowers. Can he not do the same for those he has saved from the fires of hell? That is what Jesus is saying here. It reminds me of Deuteronomy 29.5. Do you remember the Israelites when God made them wander around the wilderness? Deuteronomy 29.5 says, During the 40 years that I led you through the desert, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. That, that's wonderful. I don't think any designer can top that today. Clothes that last 40 years. Shoes that last 40 years. Not even Reebok or Nike can top that. It was an act of God. How can God provide for our needs today? He can make them last, or He can use other people, or He can bless you yourself. He can do it in several ways, but God's promise is that if He takes care of nature, why not you? You belong to Him. You're much more precious to Him. That's His point. Thirdly, He's saying do not worry because it doesn't change anything in your situation. Verse 27, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? We already know a lot from medical science. Worrying doesn't just uh, sound futile. It actually shortens your life. The more you worry, the more diseases you put on yourself. The more you worry, existing diseases could be aggravated by it. Stress, unresolved stress, can either cause or aggravate your existing conditions. So what is Jesus saying? Not only does it not lengthen your life, it actually could perhaps shorten it and not only that, worry affects the quality of a person's life even when it cannot change its length. I mean, your life may not seem long, may not be actually longer, but if you worry, it seems much longer. It's torture. So that's the problem with worry. It's completely useless. It doesn't change anything. That's why somebody said, uh, he said, at 20, we worry about what others what others think of us. At 40, we don't care what they think of us. At 60, we realize they never thought about us at all. <laughs> well, that's a humorous way of saying that you and, you and I should not build our lives even about what others think or what we think because it doesn't matter. But the more important point here is that what Jesus asked here when he said, Who of you by worrying can add a single art to his life? is actually pointing out the sovereignty of God over my life and yours. Does it bother you to think about this? The exact day and date and manner of your death is already known to God. Down to the last second. Down to the last breath. I don't know how I will go. Will it be because I'll try bungee jumping and the, rap, the cord will snap or whatever? I don't know. Will I die at 99 or will I die next week? I don't know. But you know what? This is what Deuteronomy 32.29 says. God is speaking here. He said, See now that I myself am He. There is no God besides me. I put to death. I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. And no one can deliver out of my hand. What does this mean? Because God has determined the duration of each person's life. Lack of food will not result in premature death. And the abundance of food will not prolong life. In fact, it's the opposite. You, you know the 101 buffet menu somewhere in Rojas? Uh, you could die there. 
I mean, if you eat too much. You know, when I was growing up, before I, I went to med school, I thought it was a legend that you could die after a very fatty meal. Now, with all the studies coming out, it's true. You can get a heart attack after a very heavy meal. So, it's not just that the lack of food will cause premature death or abundance will not prolong life. Sometimes it's the opposite. But Jesus, by reminding his audience of their limitations, who of you by worrying can add a single R, he reminded them, God has already determined the length of your life. What's the point of worrying about it? None. Number four, Jesus said that, well, you do not worry because it actually means you've stopped trusting God. Verse 30, he said, oh, you of little faith. Then verse 32, for the pagans, run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows you need them. You know what it makes me realize? He was not telling the disciples not to enter into worry. He was rebuking them. For right then and there being people worrying about something. He called them, O oh, you of little faith. Do you know that Jesus uttered that phrase five times in the whole of Scripture? Every single time he was scolding his disciples. Not the Pharisees. Not the pretenders. He was scolding the genuine people. Uh, that's both uh, a warning and an encouragement. It's a warning. You and I can fall into the same error. It's an encouragement in the sense that you know how they turned out. Almost all of them except one eventually turned out okay. It means today you came in here, you struggle with your faith. Maybe you can say, Lord, that applies to me. I am of little faith. Take heart. God molded the disciples to become people that he could use for his glory and for his name. It could be true for you and me today. Jesus earlier asked, why do you worry? In verse 28, he answers the question in verse 30 by saying, you of little faith. The root of all worry is unbelief. In truth, the root of all sin is unbelief. It's a warped view, a wrong view of God that I take upon myself. When I worry, it's like this. I either say, Lord, you have no idea what I'm going through, so I am worried. Or it could be like this. Lord, you have an idea what I'm going through, but there's nothing you can do about it. Your power is not that great. Or it could be this. Lord, you know what I am going through. I know you can do something, and this is the worst self-deception of all friends. You know and you can do something, but you don't care enough to help me. That's the worst thing we can deceive ourselves about because it's not true. That's where our worry comes from. You don't know, Lord, or you, you know, but you're not powerful enough to do something. It's impossible, Lord. Who can change the hearts of this man, this woman? Or who can change this impossible situation? Or Lord, you can, you know, but you don't care. I hope we stop lying to ourselves that way because God knows. He can do something about it. His power is never limited. He cares. We just don't know His timing. We just don't know His ways. His ways are not our ways. His time is not our time. You might feel like Job, and I will resort to that example again. You know that Job chapter 42 shows God bring him out of it. I don't know what chapter in your life you are if you compare yourself to Job, but you will reach your Job chapter 42. You just need to trust God, my brother, my sister, while you're in the midst of that. And Jesus would even say, that kind of worry is similar to paganism. He said in verse 32, the pagans, they run after all these things. Why compare those who worry to pagans? You know, paganism had idols that could not see, nor hear, nor move, nor feel, nor speak. Powerless, completely 
powerless. And so what do pagans do? They, they, they do everything. They resort to multiple gods to pray to. If this god doesn't work, I'll turn to this god. Maybe this god will not work, I'll turn to the other god. Or multiple prayers. Or saddest of all, they will offer things precious to them to their gods, like food and drink. How ironic, because the pagan gods seemingly demand food and drink and precious things for them to act. But the God, the true God of Israel, Jesus described him as somebody who gives food and drink and clothing. And so Jesus is saying, don't be like the pagans. They offer to their gods, your God, the true God. He gives, he doesn't take. That's what he's saying, friends. And he's saying in verse 32, Your heavenly Father knows you need them. That's why one of the shortest petitions in the Lord's prayer is, Give us this day our daily bread. That's all he said. Why? Because your heavenly Father knows you need daily bread. We don't need to convince him. He knows it. That's why Jesus is saying, When you worry, it really means you've stopped trusting God and Fifth, the fifth reason he doesn't want us to worry is worrying about the future is useless because the present demands full attention. Verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In fact, worrying about the future makes us mishandle the present. I'm speaking from my own life. The more I worry about the future, the more often I mishandle the present, practically guaranteeing I'm going to have a worse future. So Jesus offers two reasons for not worrying about the future. First, he said, tomorrow will worry about itself. Be being a good teacher, Jesus personified the future as an imaginary character who perhaps is pacing around, his forehead wrinkled, his brows meeting together, hyperventilating on the verge of a panic attack. But that's not God, our Father, friends. Some well-meaning Christians say, God worries about the future so you don't have to. That's well-meaning, but that's wrong. God never worries about the future. Our God, the Father, is never a nervous wreck. So Jesus said, Tomorrow will take care about itself. Don't worry about it. And secondly, he said, each day has enough trouble of its own. I love this phrase. It tells me when Christ saved me, he didn't say, from now on you'll never have problems. Read that verse again. Each day has enough trouble of its own. For as long as I have life and breath, I'll have trouble. I hope nobody sold you on that wrong teaching. When you become a Christian, your problems are over. No. But for the first time in your life, there's somebody who will give you sufficient grace for day to day. That's Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. His mercies are renewed every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It is of the Lord's mercy. That we are not consumed. That's what you've got because you're a believer in Christ. Because my brothers and sisters, God's remedy for worry is to put God first, then to trust Him with all your heart. When you put God first, you are never last in His eyes. That's what He's saying now in Matthew 6.33. God's remedy for worry. Five reasons why we should not worry and just one remedy. Matthew 6.33 But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek God Himself through Christ above everything else. Seek the giver and the gifts will follow. So what is the kingdom of God? Whenever Jesus used that to refer to the life that we have here on earth, it always refers to God's rule over the life of those who belong to Him. It's His Lordship over our life. He's saying, 
I want you to make the highest priority of your life God's lordship over you. Because when you do that, His righteousness will come to you. It's not something that's separate. These two are inseparable. If I see Christ first, if I seek that the Lordship of Christ is the most important thing in my life, if like Paul I will say, I count all things as dung, as manure that I may know Christ, if I have that kind of attitude, Jesus is saying, you will become somebody who is transformed by the righteousness of Christ. And then God says, all these things will be given to you as well. They will come to you. And that's important to reflect on. It means that when Jesus said all these things, He's not saying, you seek God today. And in, in the future, in the future, in heaven, God is so kind to you, He'll give you a reward. He's talking about life here and now, friend. He's saying, if you seek the giver and not the gift, if you seek God Himself in this life, all these things, what things? Food, drink, clothing. All of these things will be added to you as well. He's saying, in other words, well, not only are you going to be given all the gracious gifts of God, which is His kingdom. You seek His kingdom, He'll give it to you. You seek His righteousness, it will come to you as you put God first. But He says, I don't stop there. I don't just give you the kingdom. I don't just give you my righteousness. I will provide for your thirst. I will satisfy your hunger. I will clothe your body as well. That is the promise of God. The question is, can you and I trust God that if we take Him at His word, Lord, if I really put you first in my life, are you really going to take care of my needs? And only you can answer that. And the other question is, is God really first in my life and yours? Do you remember when you first came to know the Lord? Do you remember those first few days, those first few weeks, first few months? Maybe somebody had to tell you, you know, uh, maybe you can stop talking to me about Christ now. I, 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 I received him already. Or maybe your mother has to tell you, you know, you've spent three hours over that quiet time. You used to despise the Bible, but when you became a new Christian, you couldn't get enough of it. You couldn't get enough of Christian songs and Christian fellowship. There was a fire in you, a fire in me. Is it still there? Or over the years, over the years, because God was good to us, did the gifts somehow take the place of the giver? Is God still first in my life and yours, friends? Or is God now saying to us again through these words, you need to seek me again. You need to make me first again. I will no longer be lining up with all the other priorities of your life. I want to be the first and highest priority of your life again. And then when you do that, I need you to trust me that I'll take care of all the rest of your life so that you can stop worrying about it. But is Christ really first in my life and yours? Or are we simply struggling to line him up along with all the other priorities of our life. Career, business, spouse, children, reputation, degrees, bank accounts, real estate, whatever it is, friends, let's not make our God be part of the lineup. Let's put him first because he said, if we will make him first, he'll take care of the rest of our life. But let's be practical. How do we make the kingdom of God and his righteousness foremost in our lives? First, bring before God in prayer whatever causes anxiety in your heart. That's very clear in Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, 
with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. That's how you get rid of anxiety. Bring it before God in prayer. You see, you have a choice. You can worry and then plan, or you can pray and then plan. I hope you make the right choice. Secondly, we bring before God in prayer our desire to know Him deeper and more intimately. It's communion today. Maybe it's an opportunity for us to come before the Lord again and tell Him, Lord, I admit it. You used to be first and highest and foremost in my life. But I'm coming to you again today to renew that commitment to make you first in my life. I will seek the kingdom of God again, first and foremost. I will seek your righteousness again. You do that through prayer, and you can do that today. And thirdly, you can build your life around seeking God, and as you become more and more like Christ, your entire perspective about life will change. God is not somebody, friends, who wants to hide himself. From his children. He is a father who wants to hear the voice of his children. He wants to hear his children say, I seek you with all my heart. Jeremiah 29 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Are we indeed seeking him with all our hearts? I look back over my own life. Some of the most spectacular failures I've ever made were because I failed to trust God. So what did I do? I trusted in fickle men, or I put my trust in my frail self, or most of the time I actually did both, consistently friends. When I failed to trust God, the outcome was always disaster. Over the years, this verse has become more and more precious to me. I pray it will be the same for you. Psalm 37, 25, I was young, now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Is not life more important than food or the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. Are you not much more valuable than they? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. I so often forget that. Again and again through good people, good books, good preachers, good trials. God reminds me. God's remedy for my worry is to put God first than to trust Him with all my heart. When I put Him first, I am never last in His eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank You because through the words of Christ, we realize how much You really care for us. We often forget, Lord. Maybe that's why You mandated we observe communion. When we are reminded of grace, of undeserved grace poured upon us through the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, every single time, Lord, we are brought back to the reality of who you are. You know everything we go through. You can do something because your power is without limit. And most of all, you care enough, O oh God. You really do. Before we go to communion, I'd like to give us a few moments of personal silent prayer. A time of self-examination. If you brought your troubles with you here into this worship today, I'd like you to just pray to the Lord right now. If God has stopped being first in your life, I'd like you to pray to the Lord right now and tell Him, this has to stop. And you are putting him back where he should always have been. Seeking first his kingdom. Not worrying because you trust him. May I request you, if this is the need of your heart, to just come to him right now and, and settle this between yourself and the Lord in a couple of minutes of personal silent prayer.
Heavenly Father, there is no single prayer sent up to you right now that you will not hear when it comes from a sincere heart, O Lord. So I'm praying for my brothers and sisters as some of them or many of them come before you. I pray, O God, that you will help them remember this day, this time, that they settle this with you, Lord, that they will not fail to trust you anymore, not fall to worry, Lord, as a way of life. And perhaps some of us need to commit our lives again and make you first and seek you first. Father, enable them to do that because you delight to hear a prayer like that. Thank you for the communion we're about to undertake, Lord. An opportunity for us to celebrate your grace. Thank you, Father, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask the church leaders to come, pastors, the elders.